Um, good evening and thank you for joining us on our online talk this evening. Um, so my name is Claire Johnson, I work at BSMS in the Outreach and Emissions team and we are going to be delivering this one hour talk by Dr. Uh, Professor Chris Pepper who I'll introduce in a second. Just to make you aware, we are recording this um, talk. So basically within about a week's time, we'll be able to send you out the link and you'll be able to um, watch it again if you would like to. Um, so you should have seen a button come up on your screen so you can um, click on that and you'll be in the session. There is a Q&A section on the bottom of your webinar. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Chris through the talk, if you put your questions in there and basically at the end of the talk, we will take those questions on. There's the opportunity to upvote. So if you see a question that you really like, um, rather than typing it again, you can just upvote it and that puts it to the top of the pile. I have two colleagues that are in the room as well. So Enya and Matt, they will be answering any questions. So Enya is a first year student. So if you've got any questions with regards to accommodation, what is it like at BSMS, Enya will be able to help you. Matt works in our admissions team. So if you've got any questions about entry requirements or I don't know, interviews or anything like that, Matt will be able to help you on those. Um, anything about the talk, we will wait to the end for um, Chris to be able to give you the correct answers rather than us trying to guess the answers. Um, so, so I'd just like to introduce um, Professor Chris Pepper. So he, he, he Professor Chris Pepper gained his PhD in medical chemistry from the Welsh School of Pharmacy in 1993. Since then, his research career has been primarily focused on one disease, chronic lymphonic leukemia. He has published more than 100 research papers, as well as numerous reviews and editorials, and has constantly secured grant funding from major sources, including Leukemia and Lymphoma Research, now called Bloodwise, Cancer Research UK, and the Association of International Cancer Research. His research has made a number of notable contributions to the field of CLL and is internationally recognised as demonstrated by sustainable contributions to the world literature in high impact factor journals, including papers in leukaemia, blood, journal of clinical oncology, cancer research, clinical cancer research, nature communications and nature genetics. In addition, he is an author of eight global patents and the co-founder of a Cardiff University spin-out company called Telonot6. For more than two decades, Chris's research has been focused on the understanding the mechanisms that underpin the development of disease progression and drug resistance using primary chronic lymphomic leukemia cells as a model. Throughout his career, Chris has shown a constant commitment to teaching and learning at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels. He has contributed lectures, seminars, and tutorials to numerous undergraduate degree modules and has successfully supervised more than 20 postgraduate research degrees. So on that note, Chris, I will hand over to you. Okay. Thank you, Claire. I'm not sure I recognize that chap, but um, yeah, I am Chris Pepper. Anyway, um, welcome to everybody that's here. It's so lovely to actually see people in person after our enforced COVID lockdown. And in that regard, I've got my mask off, but I am COVID negative as of this morning, at least. So hopefully my spit won't get that far anyway, but we should be safe. Okay, so what am I going to do this evening? Well, I'm going to talk to you about my obsession, my hobby, my passion, and actually, how lucky for me, my job as well, um, and talk to you about this disease, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And what I'd like to do is sort of make it almost like a history lesson. So we'll talk about what was known about CLL when I first started working on this disease, and what we now know about this disease and how that new knowledge about the biology of this disease has transformed the way that we treat patients. Now, despite what Claire might have said, I didn't produce most of the advances that you'll, we'll talk about this evening. I've made a small contribution, that's true. But what I really want you to take away from this evening about research is that it's a team game. So individuals, yeah, of course they matter, but actually 
we're, we're playing for each other. And the sharing of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge is really what drives innovation and advance forward. Yep, yeah, sure. Oh yeah, well, I've got a great face for radio as the audience here can tell. Um, but for those of you online, here I am. Okay, so, oh, now why doesn't this work? It worked perfectly just now. Okay. Maybe I'll do it from here. Is it actually, it's not moving forward at all. Yeah. Okay. I wonder if this is going to actually work now. Yeah, it is. Perfect. Great. Thanks, Claire. Okay. So you can see here, there's a bit of a timeline. Um, so we, I've broken this down into two blocks of history, if you like. So the era, era of chemotherapy, and we'll talk a little bit about what we mean by that term chemotherapy in the next 40 minutes or so. And then the era of targeted therapy. And I'll talk a lot more about what I mean by that. Okay, so chronic lymphocytic leukemia, well, what is it? Um, it's the most common form of adult leukemia in the Western world. And it affects about five in 100,000 people, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for a cancer, that's actually quite a common illness. It affects men more than women in a ratio of about two to one. And we really don't understand why that is. But to diagnose this problem, and actually this is perhaps the first change that I would want to emphasize to you when I started work on CLL back in 1994, 93 actually, um, the diagnosis of CLL wasn't that straightforward. But with advances in antibody technology. So this is the ability to recognize or identify proteins on the surface of cells and use that in conjunction with very clever technology called flow cytometry. We can use these markers on the surface of cells to identify both diseased cells and normal cells. And so and in so doing, get a differential diagnosis of all sorts of different um, blood diseases. So a diagnosis of CLL is really definitively defined by the co-expression of CD19 and CD5 on the surface of B cells. We haven't got time today for me to talk to you about what a B cell is. I give lectures on that here at the medical school, but essentially it's a type of lymphocyte. Okay, the causes of CLL are still unknown. Um, but what we do know, just like all cancers, they are genetic in origin. So that, by that I mean there are genetic changes that happen in these B cells that cause them to um, become abnormal in some way. They functionally change and in so doing cause a problem to the individual that has them. We now know because of... Uh, advances in omic technologies, that these cells not only have genetic changes, but they also harbor epigenetic changes. So these are changes in not the code of the DNA, but in how that code is expressed in terms of um, whether a gene is activated and transcribed or whether it is repressed or silenced. We'll come to this in a few minutes, but there's also a very curious familial link with CLL. So patients or individuals who have a family member who have a B-cell malignancy of any description, but CLL in particular, are at higher risk of developing CLL themselves. Anything between two and seven fold higher risk. And we now understand, and I'll talk to you a lot about this in the next 40 minutes or so, that the disease is really driven by the microenvironment in which the tumor lives. So 
the blood because it's a leukemia, but perhaps more importantly, the lymph nodes, the lymphoid tissues that B cells naturally traffic back and forwards to uh, in their natural life course. And B cell receptor signaling. So this is a very specialized receptor on the surface of the B cell actually contributes to the pathology. And again, we'll talk a lot about that over the next uh, few minutes or so. So why am I interested in CLL? Well, the truth of it is, this is where it gets the personal title. Um, this guy in the picture here, that's, that's me, if you can believe it or not. Um, but this chap is my dad, or was my dad, and that's a picture of him uh, who is a little bit older. And my dad was diagnosed with CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, in 1992. So the eagle-eyed eagle amongst you will see that he was diagnosed firmly in the era of chemotherapy. So what did that mean? Well, in those days, we really only had three drugs that were available for the treatment of this type of leukemia. Steroids, which really didn't attack the tumor specifically at all, um, but had some impact on the pathology. And then these two chemotherapeutic drugs, chlorambucil, which believe it or not, is a solid form of nitrogen mustard, the gas that was used in World War I trenches. So if that's making you think that that's not something that I'd want to put in my body, I'm with you all the way. I, we use these drugs not because um, they were really targeted effective therapies, but because we really didn't have anything else at our disposal. The other drug, which was in the, in, uh, when my dad was diagnosed, the new kid on the block, is this drug here called fladarabine, fladarabine monophosphate, which although isn't quite as uh, gross a toxic drug as chlorambucil was, um, in fact, still damaged DNA. So because all chemotherapeutic drugs essentially bind to or uh, interact with DNA, you can imagine that the therapeutic window, if you like, the, 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 the difference between the toxicity that we see against the tumor cell versus the toxicity that we might induce in normal surrounding tissues is non-existent. So effectively, the normal tissue is just as susceptible to the drugs as the leukemia or the cancer. And so you can imagine, therefore, that these drugs induced a lot of very, very unwelcome side effects. So none of the available treatments when my dad was diagnosed actually improved your overall survival at all. There was not a single shred of evidence in the world literature that treating patients with this disease actually improved their clinical outcome. So against that backdrop, you can imagine that we weren't really very happy as a family when my dad got this diagnosis. Um, now, combining drugs for the treatment of cancers has been something that has been done historically for a long, long time. But CLL, it came late to the party. But I think you can see here that the combination of two chemotherapeutic drugs, fludarabine and another one called cyclophosphamide, this so-called FC regimen, actually did improve progression-free survival. So this uh, dotted line here, you can see that the progression of these patients is being slowed compared to fladarabine monophosphate therapy or chlorambucil therapy. But what I really want you to take away from this part of the talk is that even though progression-free survival was changing, overall survival didn't change at all, even when we combined two toxic agents together. So increased toxicity did not mean increased effectiveness against the disease. It then took us till 2009, okay, to actually produce 
a combination of drugs that, that really had an impact on the overall survival of patients. So this regimen, FCR, fladarabine, cyclophosphamide, and the addi addition of a monoclonal antibody. So if you like, the first introduction of a targeted therapeutic agent um, actually caused an increase in overall survival for the first time for patients with this disease. So great news. We, we come up with a, a new therapeutic regimen that actually was beneficial to patients in the long run. But you can see that rituximab was actually born, if you like, just at the very cusp of this era of chemotherapy. Um, and it took us another over a decade to actually identify that by combining it with chemotherapy, we were actually going to get a beneficial therapeutic effect. So not really a radical, you know, timely advance. So I would argue that empirical clinical trials, so by that I mean just randomly mixing drugs together, um, really have shown some advances, but very, very slowly. And the whole premise of what I do for a living now is to try to accelerate that advance, to try to improve therapeutics for patients in a more rational, designed way. So in order for us to be able to do that, I believe that we need to understand the biology of the disease so that then we can go after targets that are very specifically required or the, if you like, the tumor is addicted to those targets that normal tissue isn't. And in so doing, widen that therapeutic index, reduce the side effects and improve the outcome for patients. So two questions I want to sort of ask with you, um, rhetorically at least this evening, is can we identify patients who would particularly benefit from certain types of drugs? And then can we identify new biological targets that will improve treatment for all patients? Now, sadly, all of these advances I'm gonna to talk to you about didn't help my dad. So my dad died in 1997. So five years after his diagnosis, he died of his disease. And this is very common. Uh, even today, he died of an infectious complication. So he didn't die of his disease itself, but he, he died because he got an infection because his immune system simply wasn't able to deal with what you or I would handle very readily. Um, so, but you can imagine because it's a disease of B cells, it's not such a big leap of faith to imagine that those B cells that are not functioning as they should have a negative impact on the immune response. So it turns out that we now know by looking at the biology of this disease that in fact CLL is two diseases, not one. So we have two different scenarios going on in patients who have this disease. In one scenario, the B cell that gets the malignant transforming event, so becomes a cancer, is more like a normal B cell. So in that, in, in, at least in this regard, so normal B cells, when they experience an antigen, so typically if we take a topical situation, COVID-19 infection, B cells might recognize an antigen and they will then traffic to a lymph node and they will then undergo a process called somatic hypermutation. Now, that's a very long word and I teach uh, the second years at medical school, adaptive immunology, but Thankfully for you, I won't be teaching you that today, but essentially what it does is it introduces mutations in a particular part of the genetic code in that B cell that makes a new B cell receptor that appears on the surface of the cell. And in some situations, that B cell receptor recognizes its antigen better, 
in which case that cell will go on to divide and proliferate and, be, and grow. Um, and in other situations, this random mutation event leads to a B-cell receptor that doesn't recognize the antigen any better, or in fact worse, and those B-cells are targeted to die. So those of you that have had a common or garden infection, you get swollen lymph nodes in, or swollen glands in your neck. That's exactly what is going on inside those lymph nodes. The B cells are growing, and then the ones that recognize the antigen best survive and become memory B cells, which we absolutely need in order to be the successful organism we are on this planet. And the rest of the B cells that don't recognize the antigen so well die away. So that's the first type of CLL. And that type of CLL turns out, you know, is very common and is less of a problem clinically than the other type of B cell. So the other type of B cell also sees an antigen, but for some reason, reasons that we don't quite understand, they, these B cells do not undergo that process of somatic hypermutation. So they, re, they retain their original B cell receptor unchanged, okay? And because that B cell receptor is less specific, if you like, more promiscuous, we assume that that B cell is more capable of responding to more antigens and therefore will divide more readily when it encounters those antigens. So why does all this matter? Well, it turns out that the prognosis of this disease is really determined by which type of B cell the patients have. Half of my slides get cut off by the, that bar at the top of this screen, but essentially it doesn't matter. The, the patients that, that have unmutated or untransformed B cell receptors on their surface, they have a much more activated phenotype. So they are more capable and ready to divide than their mutated counterpart. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks, Claire. So essentially the unmutated ones have got a much more activated B cell um, phenotype. And they express these antigens on their surface that are consistent with that. So they're very responsive to B cell receptor signals. And really intriguingly, these cells also have really very, very short telomeres. So what are telomeres? Well, telomeres are very specialized structures at the ends of all linear chromosomes. So every single one of us in this room has telomeres, okay? And it turns out that these structures are, one of their jobs is to act like a biological clock. So every time a cell divides, the telomere gets shorter. And when it gets to a certain length, the cell stops being able to divide. So if, if you like, it's a tumor suppressive mechanism. So it, it stops the genetic code inside the telomere, in other words, all of the genes that we need from being damaged by erosion of that chromosomal material, okay? And this is data that came out of my lab where you can see that patients who have this activated phenotype for, the, for this, you can read CD38 positive expression. They have shorter telomeres than those with less activated phenotype. And again, those individuals with unmutated immunoglobulin genes, so remember the, the worst type of B cell receptor, those that haven't undergone somatic hypermutation, again, have really short telomeres. What that does is it confers genetic instability to those cells. So these patients with unmutated genes tend to have, they tend to accumulate more genetic damage than patients that have the mutated type of CLL. And that, this Kaplan-Meier curve here shows you just how important that is because the blue line there is the mutated IGBH genes and the red line is the unmutated IGBH genes. 
And you can see that the patients with unmutated CLL have a much worse outcome than those with the other type of B-cell receptor. This leads to this, this sort of accumulation of genetic damage leads to a phenomena called clonal evolution. So this is where the, the tumor progressively changes over time, it accumulates new damage all the time, probably through the process of cell division. Okay. And now the slides won't progress anymore. Okay. Nope. Yeah, we're back to that again. Okay. No. <laughs> Even the slides are bored. <laughs> yep, that's perfect. Thanks, Claire. Okay. So as, as I showed you in the previous slide, um, patients with unmutated uh, B cell receptors have a much worse prognosis. This is some data that again came out of uh, our lab where we demonstrated that even patients who are treated with our most effective therapy, at least back then, FCR, remember that was the therapy that gave us improved overall survival, those patients with the unmutated immunoglobulin genes do much worse when we treat them with that standard of care, FCR drugs. And if we incorporate telomere length, remember I just talked to you about that, and another marker of activation, CD49D, into an algorithm, we can segregate these patients into responsiveness even further. So you can see here that the patients with uh, mutated immunoglobulin genes with long telomeres and low expression of this activation marker on their surface, this is the solid blue line, they do really well when we treat them with fladarabine, cyclophosphamide and rituximab. The, up, the, direct, the absolute opposite is true of those patients with unmutated immunoglobulin genes, short telomeres and uh, high expression of CD49D. So we can stratify patients according to their response to drugs based on these three markers alone. So we came up with this treatment algorithm, which you don't need to learn, so don't worry. But essentially, what we came up with was the idea that actually the vast majority of patients that get treated with FCR shouldn't be. OK, so 17.4 percent of patients have that really good response phenotype. So mutated IG, IGVH genes, low CD49D and long telomeres. And we would argue that the, the only reasonable thing to do would be to only treat those patients with this approach, because I'm sure you you're not that familiar at looking at Kaplan-Meier curves, but what I want you to see is that that line, the blue line, the, the, the solid blue line, is actually quite a shallow drop on the curve. And it looks like it might even be plateauing. It looks like it might be not going down anymore. So that's out after nine years of th post-therapy. So the patients haven't had drugs in their system for nine years when they're out there, okay? So this is not continuous therapy. They've stopped their treatment for nine years. So we might even use the C word and say that some of those patients might be cured with this approach, which is pretty exciting. But for the vast majority, over 80% of the patients, they do not receive long-term benefit from this approach. So we just shouldn't use it. Okay, so what about those patients that don't respond well to fladarabine, cyclophosphamide, rituximab? Fortunately, this is where the good news starts. Okay, so 
we now understand that this B cell receptor on the surface of these tumor cells is really altering the pathology of the disease. And so by generating inhibitors that block the downstream signaling below the B cell receptor, we can actually produce drugs that actively target these cells that are more active and more signaling competent. Okay. So the question that we would ask is, does this ability to signal through the B cell receptor make these cells more susceptible to the therapy? And the answer is yes. Okay, so patients with the unmutated genes with a very activated phenotype, so in this case, high levels of CD49D on their surface, are more prone to die when we treat them in a test tube with both ibrutinib, the BTK inhibitor, and adelalisib, a PI3 kinase delta inhibitor. And intriguingly, and we'll come to this in a moment, these cells also don't migrate as well when we treat them with these inhibitors. And we'll talk about why migration might be important in a moment. So we published this data in uh, leukemia uh, about seven or eight years ago now. But essentially, this is um, some work that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine which demonstrates that those patients with the poor prognosis, the unmutated genes, really preferentially benefit from treatment with ibrutinib-containing regimens. So think, think for a second, the mutated pa patients benefit particularly from FCR, and the unmutated patients benefit particularly from ibrutinib. So we've now got two very active, effective therapeutics that work in two different subsets of the disease. So pretty exciting stuff. So thinking about the biology of why migration or inhibiting migration might be important, what I want you to focus on, I remember at the start of this talk, I told you that B cells naturally traffic from the peripheral blood, the circulation, into solid tissues called lymph nodes. Well, we now know that the, the B cells only really grow significantly when they're in that lymphoid tissue. They don't divide, they don't proliferate. Even the tumor B cells don't divide or proliferate when they're in the circulation. Okay, now what ibrutinib does is it actually um, causes these lymphocytes to leave the lymph nodes. So the yellow bar, which is going inexorably downwards on this graph, is lymph node size, okay? The blue sawtoothed bar that you can see is on and off ibrutinib. So ibrutinib is given in cycles. And what you can see the eagle-eyed amongst you actually will see why the clinicians who first gave this drug almost had a heart attack. Because can you see what happened was when they first gave ibrutinib to the first couple of patients, instead of causing a reduction in their leukemia, it actually caused an apparent increase in their leukemia in their peripheral blood. And so you can imagine that wasn't what the doctors were hoping for, and it, so it took a bit of courage, I think, to carry on treating patients when they saw this increase in lymphocyte count in the peripheral blood. I'm glad they did, because essentially we then got this other data which showed that what ibrutinib was doing was not making the tumour grow more, but it was redistributing the tumour. So it was moving it out of the lymph nodes into the peripheral blood. Remember where these cells don't grow. OK, they sort of get trapped in the peripheral circulation. So the CLL cells are forced out of the lymph nodes into the blood. But it's worth remembering here that not all the CLL cells leave the nodes and some of them, in fact, can return. So the question then is, OK, 
how even though these drugs might be effective, they don't clear all of the tumor cells away. They do not eradicate all the disease. So how do we then treat what's left, what we call residual disease? Back in 1995, I started working on this protein. So a long time ago now, BCL2 protein. Okay, and this, this work, this was when I was living in Wales, working at Cardiff University, was funded by the Leukemia Research Appeal for Wales. Um, and it's worth saying that nobody else would fund this work when they did. So I'm really grateful to the LRAW for putting their faith in me and giving me the money to actually do these experiments. I hope you'll agree that their investment was worthwhile. But essentially what we managed to show was, and this was the first time in the world this has been shown, was that BCL2 expression in these tumor cells was really important in determining, determining whether the cells were capable of responding to drugs or not. So high levels of BCL2 in these tumor cells cause drug resistance, okay? And we went on to publish quite a number of papers that showed pretty much all the same evidence. So if we fast forward from 1995 to 2016, so 20 years, we're now treating patients with this new drug called venetoclax, which is a, an anti-BCL2 um, drug. OK, so what this drug does is it binds to the BCL2 protein and it displaces another molecule that it binds to that causes the cell to die. And does it work? Well, yes, it does. Vedetoclax is a blockbuster drug, not just for the treatment of CLL, but for a whole range of other different tumors, too. And you can see here that patients who are treated with venetoclax plus rituximab, we're still using that monoclonal antibody, have an incredibly good outcome compared to patients who are treated with the other standard of care, the blue line. So really exciting. And if we combine venetoclax with that other blockbuster drug called ibrutinib, and we give the patients two doses, so venetoclax and ibrutinib, what you can see is that progressively we get more and more patients into a molecular remission. So in other words, they have no detectable disease in their body at all. Yeah. So combinations of drugs really do work, but they work even better when we know how they work. So instead of going back to our FCR drug combination, where we still don't understand quite how that combination works, venetoclax plus ibrutinib, we understand how that is targeting different pathways in the cell, and therefore combining them has a more than additive effect. It has a synergistic effect. But and there's always a but in cancer research, we're already starting to see the emergence of resistance patterns in patients who've been treated with venetoclax and ibrutinib. And one of the um, major areas of interest for our research group here at Brighton and Sussex Medical School is trying to understand that resistance. And we've identified this molecule called TLR9 toll-like receptor 9, that appears to be altered when cells are challenged by either a brutinib, venetoclax, or the combination. And that leads them to um, become less dependent on those B-cell receptor signals and on BCL2 itself. And so therefore leads to uh, the cells becoming insensitive to those drugs. So part of what we're trying to do is understand whether we can actually inhibit TLR9 signaling in these cells so that we can overcome that drug resistance. So 
over the last 30 years, I think, I, well, I hope I've convinced you that a lot has changed in this disease. I think my dad would be quite amazed to see where treatments are and the way patients are managed today compared to what his experience was back in 1992. And for the first time, I think I would be advocating to him that he gets treatment because back then, remember, there were no treatments that improved your survival at all. So you got all the downside, the side effects without any of the upside, the, the increased life expectancy. OK. But I would very much argue that these hard won advances that we've seen in CLL are because we now understand the tumor biology so much better than we did then. So we're designing rational drugs rather than empirical drugs, ones that target molecules in the cell, the tumor cell, that they really need in order to grow. OK. And the really exciting thing about all of those advances is that they even work in patients who had previously got what we call refractory disease. So disease that was inherently more difficult to treat than um, some patients have. So, and I, I did tell you there is a but, you know, that there is still work for us to do. None of these treatments that I've talked to you about this evening are yet classified as curative. In fact, ironically, those mutated patients with low CD49D and long telomeres probably are the closest to cure of any patient group. So they're treated with old school chemotherapy and they're actually cured of their disease probably, at least a fraction of them are. So we've still got some, some uh, distance to go to actually get to a point where we can treat every single patient effectively um, and improve their life expectancy and maybe even dream about achieving cures. But I firmly believe that by taking a more personalized approach to their therapy, by understanding their individual tumor biology, we will attain that goal and we will get to a point where every single patient has a long and good life expectancy. So, as I said to you right at the very beginning of this talk, this isn't about me at all. All the best research is done in teams, and I couldn't have done half of the work that I've shown you this evening without the support of all these people on this screen. And, and it's, it's an inevitable fact as well that all those people need to be paid somehow. So all these funders that you can see on the screen too are just as important in the research life cycle as the individuals that do the research, because without them, nobody would be employed. So Blood Cancer UK, Worldwide Cancer Research, my favorite old school charity, the Leukemia Research Appeal for Wales, Cancer Research UK, of course, the Wellcome Trust, and the Medical Research Council, who are funding the bit of research that I talked about last, this bit around TLR9 escape mechanisms driving resistance against venetoclax and ibrutinib. So this is the team that currently works with us over the road at the Medical Research Building. And I started by telling you that this is a very personal thing for me. My dad got CLL and that's how I ended up researching CLL. And just because I like a bit of symmetry in life, um, this lady is my wife and we work together as a husband and wife team here researching CLL. So it really, I do like to keep it in the family. Thank you ever so much for listening and I'll be delighted to take your questions. So, have I bored you witless? Do you think there'll be technological advancements that will mean that 
Okay. So for, for those of you listening online, the question is, what do I think the future of cancer research is? Um, I think to start with, I think the future of cancer research, I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist, but I think the future of cancer research is really optimistically bright. Um, and the reason why I say that is that the tools that we have available to us today to, dis to describe individual patients' tumour cells in so much detail will allow us to understand what makes one patient behave differently to another and what drug combinations might be best deployed for that individual. And so I, I envisage a time in the not too distant future when all oncology doctors will have access to the, the patient, the individual patient's genome. Their, and by that, I mean all of their genetic code, not just their constitutive genome. So that means what they were born with, but also what their tumor cells now possesses. Because remember, all cancers arise because of genetic change in a particular cell type. So once we know what their constitutive genetics are and what their tumor genetics are, we should be in a really strong place, not just to be able to identify drugs that will target the tumor, but also to think about how they might metabolize particular drugs. Some patients are super metabolizers because of constitutive genetics, and some are not great metabolizers of some types of agent, and that makes them more toxic. So I hope that gives you some idea of where I think the future is. The future is definitely in personalized medicine. And I think not just for cancer patients, for all patients, actually. So we will increasingly be treating the patient, not the disease. And you might argue that that's exactly what we should have always been doing. Because why, why were they, they used the two drugs in the early stages? Mm -hmm. Why were those two used totally? But it sounds as though they, they didn't really understand what was happening. Yeah. So, yeah, again, just, just to repeat the question. So why, why did um, clinicians combine fludarabine and cyclophosphamide in the early days um, of therapies for CLL? And the short answer is they didn't have anything else. Um, so when frontline therapy of fludarabine failed or frontline therapy with chlorambucil failed, they used a cocktail of fludarabine and this other C drug, cyclophosphamide. Um, yeah, so that, that's really why I described them as empirical methodologies, if you like. It was a sort of suck it and see scenario. There wasn't really a lot of um, biological evidence that these combinations of drugs would work effectively together. So what we were left with, with just ramping up the toxicity. So adding more and more chemotherapy in an attempt to try to arrest the growth of the disease. And, you know, if, if, it, if I'm making, you know, previous doctors or historical sort of approaches seem like a little bit Luddite and um, uninformed, I don't mean to do that because they were working with the best knowledge that was available at the time. But that's why I'm such a passionate believer in, you know, the understanding the biology is the key to unlocking the, the, the way to treat disease. I'm gonna take a- Yeah, for sure. If it works, yeah. Um, so one of the questions online is, does Ventroclax work for both mutated and unmutated BCR subtypes of CLL? <laughs> yeah, so it, it does, yes. So Venetoclax does work for both types of disease. Um, and it's, it's sort of um, an interesting clinical conundrum, I would say. I would be the first to say I am not a clinician. I'm a scientist, so I don't have these really difficult decisions to make. And, you know, doctors have a tough gig. 
when it comes to dealing with patients and working out what, what to do with them in terms of treatment. Um, but yeah, in theory, venetoclax should work for both mutated and unmutated CLL. They both express BCL2, which is the target of venetoclax. So it is a rational choice to treat them with venetoclax. But as I think you probably saw, and I buried it in the slide, the unmutated cases more often have higher levels of BCL2. And so we might argue would benefit most from venetoclax therapy. Just do one more question online. Yep. Um, how would you go into medical research, as in what would you need to take at university? Oh, blimey. OK. Um, well, how did you get into it? Yeah, so I, d I did my degree in biochemistry and then I moved across the road because I was very um, adventurous, not. Um, so I moved literally across the street to the Welsh School of Pharmacy and did an applied chemistry degree, essentially a pharmacy degree. Um, but there are so many routes into medical research. I mean, the classic route would be to do a biological science at university rather than a, so I did biochemistry as my first degree, so that is a biological science. Um, but yeah, I, I would say there's all sorts of routes into medical research. Yeah. Okay, so the, the question is, is there anything I can do to actually determine whether I'm going to get CLL? Because obviously I'm familiarly linked to my dad. Um, and, and the answer is, I guess I could. Um, I mean, if I was so minded, I guess I could take blood from myself on a regular basis and screen it. I mean, we're, we're routinely identifying CLL lymphocytes in our lab all the time. But do you know what? I think I'd rather wait. <laughs> I, I'd like to live in ignorance in that sense. And if I develop illness, if I had developed symptoms, then I would go to my doctor. I wouldn't try and self-diagnose, that's for sure. So, um, in the past, was CLL diagnosis terminal? Um, yes, I think largely it was. So. Some patients, this is one of the curiosities of CLL. So it's a disease that can be very, very long lived. So some patients will die with their disease, not of their disease. So it's not always a terminal diagnosis. What makes CLL a really tricky disease for patients, I think, and actually for clinicians treating them as well, is not knowing what type of CLL they will have. So I take you back to what I said, knowledge is power. You know, understanding the, the biology of the disease allows us to tell patients with more surety whether they're going to need therapy, whether we're gonna to need to monitor their disease more closely or whether they actually have a type of more indolent disease that maybe we shouldn't even classify as being a cancer. Because in CLL, if you, if you dig into the literature on this, there's quite a lot of work being done which demonstrates the psychological impact of a diagnosis of cancer in, in patients with CLL. So even those who, have, who might live for 20, 30, maybe even 40 years with this leukemia, you know, it doesn't stop them worrying that one day they'll wake up and need therapy or one day they'll wake up and their disease will progress. And that has an enormous psychological burden, not just for them, but for their family. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, can leukemia lead to lymphoma? So it's a really interesting question. In fact, you might argue that CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, is actually also a lymphoma. So what, what, what do we mean by the term lymphoma? Well, lymphoma is a disease that is found 
in lymphoid tissue. So it tends to localize in an area and grows in that area. So most of the <coughs> most of the lymphomas that we diagnose can actually also be detected in the blood. So you might argue that they are also leukemias. Yeah. But some lymphomas tend to stay more in the in the tissue. And so the lymphocytosis might be very low. CLL is one of those lymphomas that tends to traffic out of the tissue into the blood. And so more of the disease is evident in the peripheral blood. But I, I, would, I would say that the distinction is slightly moot. You know, it, it's still a disease of B cells or T cells that drives lymphoma and leukemia. And so they can be in both parts of your body. Yeah. No. So are you saying if they've got a lymphoma, we could detect their disease in the blood? Yeah. yeah, most of the time that would be true. Yes. But remember, you've got to know what you're looking for. So if the, if the disease is at a very low level in the blood, you might not pick it up from a routine blood test because we've all got we have a normal range for lymphocytes in our blood. And that normal range is quite big. OK, so your normal normal lymphocyte count will be different to mine. OK, and the other thing to remember when we when we use the term normal in science or biology, that that's got a very specific definition. It just doesn't mean um, usual. Yeah. Or the opposite. If you're outside of the normal range, you're unusual. It means that 95 percent of people are in that range. But by definition, 5% of people, 2.5% either side, are always outside that range. And that's normal for them. OK, so we can only use normal ranges as a, a sort of yardstick. You, you have to monitor people's um, blood count in order to know whether it's normal or abnormal. Does that make sense? Good. Um, so one question, and it's a bit of a big one. Oh. Um, what would you say is the most significant development in the last 10 years in research? In research? I'm assuming can, me. like in your field. Oh, in my, yeah, I was going to say. In my field of research, I, I'd have to say the introduction of those two drugs, Ibrutinib and Venetoclax. Um, I, I don't want to choose one or the other. Um, Although if you pushed me, I'd probably say because it was there first, Ibrutinib was the game changer because it was the first time that we'd ever really targeted a, a, a biological behavior, for want of a better term, of the tumor cell. So trying to switch off that B cell receptor signal, it really did transform the way that we treat CLL patients. And we're, we're now very firmly heading towards a time when the vast majority of CLL patients will not be treated with any chemotherapeutic drug. You know, and for, for those of you that were, can think back that, that in the, the rambling of this madman, you remember that I told you that chemotherapy damages DNA. So that always brings a cost. OK, so even if the cells don't die, the normal cells don't die when we treat them with chemo, we might actually be storing up trouble for ourselves by genetically altering those cells. OK, so if we can move away from chemotherapy, we should, unless we're sure that patients will be cured when we give them that chemotherapy. We're at 7.30 now, and I'm aware that we'd like to keep going for So thank mm -hmm. you so much, Chris, for your time this evening and for delivering this talk. It's been very informative. Um, um, we will be sending the recording out within the next week or so, so if anyone would like to re-watch it or um, um, has any questions, you can email us in. But we will email out to all the attendees um, links and information about the talk, so you can email us back. So. Thank you very much and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.